continue today's conversations with a presentation titled Civic Confusion on Campus. Susan J. McWilliams is Associate Professor of Politics at Pomona College, where she has twice won the Whig Award for Excellence in Teaching. She is the author of Traveling Back Toward a Global Political Theory, published by Oxford University Press. Professor McWilliams is also the editor of A Political Companion to James Baldwin, published by the University Press of Kentucky. In 2014, she won both the Graves Award in the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. Please help me welcome Susan McWilliams. Uh, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Um, it feels like a strange time to be teaching right now where I teach, which is in Southern California. Um, we've been showing up a lot in the national news lately, which as a rule of thumb at a small liberal arts college is never a good thing. <laughs> all, that, all publicity for us is usually bad publicity. Um, in case you've managed to avoid all of our newsworthy shenanigans, let me bring you up to speed. Uh, here are some of the things that have happened at the Claremont Colleges where I teach during the last three years. One. More than 200 protesters blocked access to an auditorium at Claremont McKenna College, where conservative commentator Heather McDonald was scheduled to give a talk entitled The War on Police. College administrators were compelled to cancel the in-person talk in favor of an internet live stream. Two, a student publication revealed the existence of a secret Claremont College's Facebook group with more than 300 members devoted to sharing, as they put it, anti-PC content. Much of the content shared within the group involved telling racist jokes, making fun of women and feminists, and gleefully imagining the deaths of Muslims. Three, a student publication revealed the existence of a different private Claremont College's Facebook group, this one for students of color. In that group, students posted housing advertisements, noting that white people need not apply. Four, a geology professor, one of my colleagues, made enrollment in, what, in her special small-scale introductory course by permission only, so that she could accept students for whom the small scale of the class was likely to be especially helpful. So in her course description, the professor encouraged science-phobic, first-generation, international, underrepresented, and first-year students to apply. A campus news organization reported that the professor was accepting students into the study of geology on the basis of race. The professor then received death threats from people around the country. Five, students painted the message, white girl, take off your hoops, on the side of a dormitory devoted to free speech art at Pitzer College. The students who painted the message said that they were tired of white women appropriating the ancestral styles of darker skinned women and turning them into lucrative fashions of the moment. For them, hoops, hoop earrings that is, was emblematic of this sorts of culturally appropriative offense. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Pfft, Southern California. <laughs> we deserve that a lot. Um, but I think this is one of the uh, places in which, as the old adage says, as goes California, so goes the nation. Um, in this case, as vivid as some of those events I just told you about are, none of them are all that distinct. Uh, there are variations on events taking place at colleges and universities across the country. Events marked by passionate confrontations over speech, an explicitly racialized politics, and a general atmosphere of rage and distrust. Uh, these things taking place at the Claremont Colleges are not eccentric, they're emblematic, they're not idiosyncratic, they're indicative of broader trends. May we live in interesting times, right? Um, I have one colleague, my most senior colleague at least, who can be counted on to intone that ancient Chinese curse, um, which by the way isn't actually an ancient Chinese curse, um, with a rue smile on his face. May we live in interesting times, colleague, he always says to me. Uh, I do think these times are interesting, and I mean that not as a curse and not ironically. Um, that has something to do with the perversity of being a political theorist for whom terrifying political developments are also really good professional material. Uh, but in any case, uh, like many of my colleagues, and for that matter, like many of my students, and I suspect like many of you, 
I've spent the last few years alternately and sometimes simultaneously maddened and mystified, energized and enervated, infuriated and intrigued by the contemporary climate on campus. Um, even though my day-to-day -day experience hasn't changed much, every day I still get to talk to thoughtful and earnest young people about big ideas, meaning that I have the best job in the world. The political atmosphere in which those conversations and classes take place has. So what is happening on college campuses today, and why, and what might the events on contemporary campuses bode for our political future? Now, I'm pretty sure that none of the conventional explanations that I've heard, and I know you've heard, about campus craziness, that millennials are fragile snowflakes, that millennials are obsessed with victimization, that millennials are anti-political or insufficiently political, that the specter of Donald Trump has brought terror and anger to campus, that social media ru ruins everything. I'm, I'm sure that none of those are entirely true. Um, they're not entirely false, to be sure, but they're not entirely true either. Um, so today I want to see if I can say, if not something better, then at least something else. Let me get one thing out of the way. I want to, in this talk, resist the tendency that many people have to isolate the collegiate, or more broadly, the millennial generation, and treat them as if they are from a foreign land. You know, thinking of them all as digital natives from the planet Internetlandia, bearded hipsters who grew up on exotic and unfamiliar terms. Um, for let me join the legions of folks quoting Alexis de Tocqueville at this conference. By remembering that Tocqueville warns us that one of the great intellectual temptations of democratic society is to overstate the separation between generations. People who think in basically democratic terms, as I hope all of us do, love to overstate the separation between generations. It's a core democratic conceit. Here's why. Most of us were taught at a very young age that what separates democracy from other forms of government is that in other forms of government, it matters who your parents are, and in democracy, it does not. Your formal political status is independent of your parents. As Tocqueville explains, that democratic conceit contributes to a strange way of thinking about the relationship between generations. In democratic societies, as he put it, the woof of time is every instant broken and the track of generations effaced. We democratic thinkers tend to err too much on the side of seeing generations as separate entities rather than as connected parts of the same story. We tend to neglect the truth that we are not wholly self-creating beings, that the child does not spring fully formed from the womb, and that the child is never fully separable from the parent. We Americans are always courting an ignorant pastlessness, as Toni Morrison calls it, when we conceptually rip generations apart. Uh, in other words, we should probably make sure to remember that whatever's happening on college campuses today is not something that college kids made up themselves. There are college students and our kids, after all. Me. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old which means that my husband and I spend a phenomenal amount of time playing speech police. No, you may not call your sister a chicken butt. <laughs> no, you may not say the word butt over and over again for no reason while we are waiting in line at the grocery store. No, you may not sing the word butt even if you tell me that it is a beautiful part of the beautiful song that you are writing for your beautiful mommy. Um, of course, we do all this speech policing knowing that our children live in a world in which adults ignore even the most minimal standards of polite speech all the time. That the president gleefully uses crude words to describe lady parts. That the president ugh, talks loudly about lady parts at all barely registers in what Tom Wolfe has described memorably as the fuck patois of our age. I recall all the time how in the true and only heaven, Christopher Lash writes that it wasn't until he had children that he realized how hostile American society is to children, and more broadly to the development of children into adults. To see the modern world from the point of view of a parent, writes Lash, is to see it in the worst possible light. Because being a parent illuminates, quote, our obsession with sex, violence, and the pornography of making it our addictive dependence on drugs, entertainment, and the evening news, 
our impatience with anything that limits our sovereign freedom of choice, especially with the constraints of marital and familial ties, our preference for non-binding commitments, our third-rate educational system, our third-rate morality, our refusal to draw a distinction between right and wrong lest we impose our morality on others and thus invite others to impose their morality on us, our reluctance to judge or be judged, our indifference to the needs of future generations, as evidenced by our willingness to saddle them with a huge national debt, an overgrown arsenal of destruction, and a deteriorating environment, our inhospitable attitude to the newcomers born into our midst, our unstated assumption that only those children born for success ought to be allowed to be born at all. In the realm of public speech, our children live in a world in which no civil standards for public speech in practice exist. To say it as John Locke might say it, it's a state of license rather than a state of liberty. Um, these are conditions in Lockean terms, in terms of public speech, that are already illiberal, at best libertarian rather than liberal. That said, why should we be surprised today that today on college campuses, we see both episodes in which students say things that are deeply illiberal and deeply undemocratic, using statements like the statements that some of my students have stood behind in public. Statements like, all women's, women are just talking C words, for example, or white people need not apply. And why should we be surprised that other students are saying something to the effect of, please, 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 can we get some standards in place for public speech? Even if they're doing it awkwardly, I think that many of my students are trying to figure out a way to insist on dignified expression and the sanctity of something in a culture in which no one is afforded dignity and where little, if anything, seems sacred. I think of Kurt Vonnegut saying that the best definition he knew of sainthood is the act of behaving decently or earnestly trying to behave decently in societies that are obscene. I think it's important to remember that while we tend to think of the impulse to censor or police speech as necessarily tyrannical, one of the great insights of Plato's Republic, taken to some degree from Herodotus's histories, is that the impulse to censor or police speech can come from the aspiration to justice, truth, or even human dignity. Why should you be allowed to tell other people that the Holocaust didn't happen? Why should you be allowed to call people names and mock their young children in public? If you take speech seriously and understand its power, you at least have to acknowledge that such questions can legitimately be asked. I think, given the cultural milieu that I have described, the standard free speech defense that we're hearing today just totally misses the mark. You know how the standard defense of free speech goes. It always, always, always involves quoting John Stuart Mill. Um, I was at a conference about free speech a couple of months ago, in fact, and if at that conference you had played a drinking game in which you took a shot every time someone said John Stuart Mill, you would have, you would have had a lampshade on your head by halfway through the second session. Right? You know how this goes. Mill says that a mark of liberal societies is the free marketplace of ideas in which biased or offensive or even evil speech must be allowed for the reason that opinions that go untested stagnate as dogma and point toward tyranny. All silencing of discussion, Mill writes in On Liberty, is an assumption of infallibility, which at bottom is the philosophy of absolute princes or others who are accustomed to unlimited deference. That argument, I think, rings hollow to students who have seen in practice that it is not just silencing of discussion that is the mark of those who are accustomed to unlimited deference. Unrestrained speech itself is also the mark of those who are accustomed to unlimited deference. Think of Trump, a man who we think of in terms of unrestrained speech and who whatever else you can say about him is a man who is accustomed to unlimited deference. Unrestrained speech is also the mark of tyrants and the will to tyranny and the aspiration to tyrannize others. Tyranny is performed both in acts of silencing and in acts of unrestrained speech. Mill, at least as far as the people who tend to quote him today tend to quote him, talks right past that point, a point with which college students on both the left and the right are regularly and justifiably obsessed. Now, uh, to me, that doesn't mean that Mill's defense of free speech is worthless in the present moment. 
consider one of Mill's other essential arguments in On Liberty, that human societies, even societies that understand themselves to be liberal, might need certain kinds of understandings in place before they get to the point of opening a free marketplace of ideas. Mill says that his free speech doctrine, quote, is meant to apply only to human beings in the maturity of their faculties. Mill goes so far as to say that, quote, despotism is a legitimate form of government in those conditions in which people are ill-prepared for the exercise of liberty, provided, of course, the end be their improvement. Now, Today's free speech acolytes of Mill, of course, don't like to mention that despotism part because it smacks of paternalism and racism and colonialism, which aren't exactly hot with the kids these days, and don't sound like the kind of things that contemporary liberals think of as liberal. But you can't leave out that part of Mill's argument and actually understand Mill's argument about free speech. It is critical to Mill's argument he understands there to be social and cultural preconditions to the free marketplace of ideas. The contentious public exchange that we recognize as free speech is properly understood by Mill as the icing on a multi-layer cake. Without the cake, the icing is just a sticky mess. Right? Think of the free exercise of speech as the part of the iceberg that's visible, but which is only the tip of a larger, much larger submerged structure. 90% is below the surface. If the submerged structure isn't there, then the iceberg is going to sink. Free speech only makes sense and only seems desirable and only really works to do what Mill says it works to do in conditions when that substructure is firm underneath. It's a shame that the fuller reading of Mill rarely finds expression these days, since I think it clearly helps us to better understand what's going on on campus. To the extent that there is a free speech crisis at many of our colleges and universities, both in terms of a rise in illiberal and anti-democratic speech and in terms of the rise of the number of students who are asking for restrictions on speech, I think we would do well to remember, or do well to, do well to see the free speech crisis as the tip of an iceberg. There's a bigger crisis, I think, under the surface that is behind our crisis of speech. I mean, as Karen Zivy, who's here, reminds us in her work, speech is always about more than speech. Um, me, I think of our current crisis as a crisis of civic virtue, a crisis of civic cohesion and a crisis of civic identity. I know I'm not alone in the room in thinking something along those lines. Um, so let's talk again about identity. Uh, 50 years ago, James Baldwin said that the core American crisis was a crisis of identity. And when he said that, he did not mean it in the sense that we mean when we talk about identity politics, nor did he mean it in the 1950 sense that Mark Lilla discussed last night. For Baldwin, the identity problem is that Americans at bottom are not sure we know who we are, either as a nation or as individuals. It's a persistent theme in Baldwin's writing. Um, it's across his fiction and his nonfiction. I'm going to here refer to his novel, Giovanni's Room, when David, the American protagonist of that novel, talks about how he ran away to Europe to find himself. David then reflects that his own expression is strange. Finding oneself, he says, is an interesting phrase, not current as far as I know in the language of any other people. He muses that the phrase does not mean what it says, but betrays a nagging suspicion that something has been misplaced. Throughout his corpus, Baldwin argues that what Americans suspect they have lost is something at their very core, their identity. He writes that he discovered this during his own travels in Europe when he interrogated his feelings of connection to white Americans. He says, I went to Paris and I felt closer to the white Americans there than I did to the black Frenchmen, right? He says, why is that? He says he realized that they, the white Americans, like he, like all the other Americans in Paris, were, quote, searching for our separate identities and that the search itself connected them. That discovery, what Baldwin calls the discovery of what it means to be an American, pointed him to one of his most fundamental claims about Americanness. Americans are caught up in a crisis of identity, Baldwin writes, and this is the connection between you and me. Baldwin thinks that Americans lack a sense of identity because we all live, as Meridian Henry intones in Blues for Mr. Charlie, in a strange land, in a strange land. For the descendants of former slaves, the United States is still their Egypt, 
the house of bondage that has violently separated them from their ancestors and cut them off from the freedom and communal self-governance that they might have had otherwise. Similarly, Native Americans whose forebears were dispersed to the point of being almost destroyed live under conditions of violent separation from their past, a kind of post-apocalyptic condition. And to a greater degree than we sometimes admit, all other Americans, including Baldwin thought, necessarily including white Americans, all other Americans themselves are all the descendants of immigrants, sharing those conditions. Few of them know from whence they or their families came, and Baldwin says, the missing identity aches. For them too, Baldwin says, one can neither assess nor overcome the storm of the middle passage. One is mysteriously shipwrecked forever in the great new world. Right. Um, I've always liked the historian William Leach's way of putting this, that we are at bottom a country of exiles. Well, Baldwin observes that this kind of alienation from one's past, an alienation shared by all Americans, Baldwin says it has been faced by all Americans throughout our history. In a way, it is our history, and it baffles the immigrant and sets on edge the second generation until today. The struggle to articulate one's birthright, Baldwin include, concludes, is a distinctively American struggle, and for each American, it is, quote, in this need to establish himself in relationship to his past that he is most American. Uh, starting there, from that point, Baldwin argued that this kind of American anxiety about birthright and identity was, among other things, the core cause of white supremacy. After all, asserting that there is a fixed racial order is a way of trying to fix your position in a world against an underlying suspicion that your position is not at all fixed in the world. It's a way of trying to assert that something is not in flux for you in a world where everything else feels like it is in flux. For Baldwin, America's persistent racial hierarchizing was a symptom of the underlying status anxiety and social paranoia that is endemic to American experience. Since we like our Tocqueville around here, I know that some of you will remember that Tocqueville argues, early in democracy in America, that the earliest Anglo-American settlers flourished in large measure because they had the spirit of religion to complement and counterbalance the spirit of liberty. For those early settlers, Tocqueville explains, the experience of political and social liberty could be almost overwhelming. This is Tocqueville's language. As they go forward, the barriers which imprison society and behind which they were born are lowered. Old opinions, which for centuries had been controlling the world, vanish. A course almost without limits, a field without horizon, is revealed. Political liberty, as Tocqueville describes it, was in many ways energizing and exciting but that excitement had its limits. The experience of political liberty could and can also be unmooring and unnerving, vertiginous and strange. The early settlers, Tocqueville says, were only able to embrace political liberty with its conditions of relative political boundlessness because they had the sense of a very bounded spiritual world. For the early New Englanders, the spirit of liberty marked by a lack of certainty in the political world, depended on the presence of a certain kind of ethereal counterweight, the spirit of religion. The early settlers' religious beliefs reassured them of ultimate borders and boundaries, allowing them to thrive in conditions where the political world did not seem as fixed. I'm in Patrick Deneen territory here. In observing that for most of my students, and most students at our nation's elite colleges, there is no spirit of religion there is no point of fixity to counterbalance the anxiety and formlessness and often real terror of political freedom. They are an almost entirely secular group, powerfully reflecting one of the trends that Mark Lilla talked about last night. They don't have the sense of a very bounded spiritual world at all. Um, with all that in mind, the emergence of what we call the identity politics movement on contemporary campuses might make more sense, psychologically speaking. Quite clearly, we are looking at young people who are attempting to hold on to something that they understand to be fixed in an uncertain and anxiety-producing contemporary world to create what Nietzsche called a bounded, bounded horizon in a world that seems to have no horizon, to create some limiting condition in a culture that insists to them that there are no limits. This is my identity, one says in effect. This is a fixed thing that matters, a fixed moral reference point. 
Nor let us neglect to see that in a political landscape that is, as Lash described it, impersonal, abstract, technological, overwhelming, virtual, and bureaucratic, identity politics is a way of trying to assert the validity of one's own personhood. It too is imbued with the spirit of religion to the extent that identity politics, not unlike religion, says to people, you as a human being matter. Even if you look around this world and don't see almost anyone who looks like you in a position of power. You are more than an avatar, more than a bot, infinitely more and worthy of that recognition. Um, I'm gonna echo Angela here and say black lives matter, right? That is a moral and not an individualist claim. It's a claim that calls upon other people to regard you in a particular way, it calls upon us to regard each other in more than a particular way. It is a, it's a claim that weighs on all of us, essentially no different than the rallying cry of the Memphis sanitation workers organized by Jim Lawson and galvanized by Dr. King in 1968. Right? Remember that phrase, I am a man. Today, at least, you'd be hard pressed to find someone say that the sanitation strikers and their claim, I am a man, were narcissist, narcissistic navel gazers. But note that the moral content of the signs they held is indistinguishable from signs that say black lives matter. Um, all that said, um, I actually don't wanna overstate the weight of what we call identity politics on campus and among young people more generally. Um, because I'm not sure that identity politics is the be all and end all of millennial politics. I wanna contest the idea that it is. Consider that in the 2016 primary season, Bernie Sanders won more young people votes than Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump combined. And it wasn't even close. Sanders, who never did an ad identity politics pitch, won two million young Americans votes in the primaries. Clinton and Trump, who each did make identity politics appeals, identity politics appeals of very different sorts, but identity politics appeals, won fewer than 1.6 million votes combined. When push came to shove, young voters told the oldest, chose the oldest, whitest guy, and I'm taking into account Trump's orangey hue here and calling Bernie the whitest, <laughs> um, a man whose appeal had in common with identity politics only, or at least mostly, its insistence on affirming equal human dignity through policy. Those many young Sanders supporters who refused to support Clinton were not doing so for identity politics reasons. They thought that Clinton embodied a Democratic Party that had long since ceased to be sufficiently democratic. If they leaned into moral absolutism as opposed to civic realism, as young people often do, it came less from identity politics and more from inchoate democratic longings. Those longings, the clear longings of our young people to inhabit a society more democratic and more liberal than the one, I mean that in the small L sense, than the one in which they've been raised, is probably what we should really be talking about. Um, all of this is to say that the political climate that we see on today's colleges, campuses in America, I think, um, is to some degree both predictable and understandable. It's born of longer term trends and bigger underlying conditions than we tend to acknowledge. Um, though in saying that, that contemporary campus politics are predictable and understandable, I don't want you to think that what's happening on college campuses shouldn't worry you. I think we should be worried um, that college students today are kind of canaries in a coal mine. And when you're in a canary in a coal mine situation, it doesn't really matter what you think of the canaries. What you'd better do is try to help everybody get out of the coal mine. One should at least consider the possibility that the canaries are chirping about victimization because they really are victims. Millennials and college students have not created this moment. They're trying to respond to the moment in which they've been placed, and it's not an easy moment. This generation of students has come of an age in what Lash calls, I promised Eric Miller I would only quote Lash twice to leave him some Lash left for his talk this afternoon. This generation of students has come of age in what Lash calls schizophrenic conditions. While yes, they have been bolstered at the church of self-esteem told that they are special and lived in a world where everyone wins every game at Chuck E. Cheese, they also have plenty of evidence that in practice, they might be America's first generation of disposable children. That phrase, by the way, comes from Eric Wright in his astonishing book, Generation Kill, a book which perhaps tellingly a student first brought to my attention. Think back, if you will, to those words of lashes about what America really looks like to a parent 
then think again about what America really looks like to a child or an adolescent today. One thing that Americans have proven without a doubt in the last generation, in the last 20 years, is that we have a remarkable tolerance for the slaughter and mass murder of children and adolescents. Well, ultimately, I read the current politics on campus at the, as the earnest, if adolescent, because of course adolescents are adolescent, attempts of young people to assert their own dignity and moral worth in a society that repeatedly denies them and others a sense of basic dignity and moral worth. They are trying to figure out how to assert themselves as democratic citizens in a country where they've been limited mostly to the world of techno-libertarian consumption. I do not always, I don't even often agree with the political means and methods that my students employ, nor do I always or even often agree with the way that they frame and understand the world. Um, but rather than dismiss them or exoticize them, I hope that the rest of us will work with them, not just to hone their skills and senses as political actors who can pursue power through institutional means, but also more broadly to fight with them on behalf of their dignity and by extension, our own. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, th th thanks a lot for that. Um, you really gave me a lot, a lot to think about. And the stuff about Baldwin in particular, I'm, I'm mm. curious about. Because uh, I read Giovanni's room recently, and um, but all those weren't quotations from Giovanni's room, were they? Or were they no, that's a time? combination of Giovanni's room and a lot, a, a number of the different essays. <clears throat> okay, um, you know, one of the reasons I'm dissatisfied about the debates about free speech today mm -hmm. is that I think we're conflating two sorts of issues, and you mm -hmm. brought up both of them, and we use the term free speech to talk about. One of them is uh, norms of public discussion. Right, and um, you know the the fact that Americans, you know, don't have never been uh, ones for enforcing uh, these things, uh, and that I understand. The other thing, though, is viewpoint diversity, and that's something else. That has to do really with the educational mission of the university, and that's not about simply uh, what words can be used or what sort of tone has to be used. It's about the, and here I'm going to take my shot, uh, million idea that um, the whole point of speech uh, of the sort he's talking about is to imagine different ways of living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are different viewpoints on how we might live. And uh, it, it, it's the second issue that I think is the most pressing. The unwillingness to listen to different points of view and to interpret other, and, and to refer these points of view to one's very self. Not to one's group necessarily, which is, can be understandable, but to my very self, the individual that I happen to be, yeah? And that is a kind of narcissism there. And so, um, what, what's, it, though I think, I think you're absolutely right that it has something to do with this traditional American search for a definable self, uh, without a doubt. But I'm not so sure that the canaries who are singing in the cages, uh, in, in the uh, caves, are the ones who are the ones who are most uh, suffering from something. I mean, I see myself, and maybe it's just that I'm in Colombia, an inverse relationship between the intensity of someone's identity politics and one's social class. Hmm. The better off you are, the more likely you are to assert these sorts of things, especially among African American students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that I can understand. You're trying to inscribe yourself into a political story, whether it's gays and lesbians or whether it's African Americans, but you feel somehow that you don't have any street credibility, so you have to search for some way to inscribe yourself in the story. But the way out of that box is to say it's not about you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to search for examples in your own life and inflate their significance to show that you have had the same experience mm -hmm. as the people in the narrative. All you have to say is, hey, I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. 
I'm pr I haven't had to suffer these things as much. That's why I'm committing my life to helping people who have suffered these things, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but, but their instinct to interpret things as being about them and different points of view as a threat to themselves, mm -hmm. I think is a separate issue from free speech. I'd like to hear you about the viewpoint diversity mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to kind of work backwards um, uh, from where you ended. I mean, the idea, this, I, I agree, I hear all the time this kind of attempt to develop street cred by emphasizing the challenges and struggles that one has faced. Though we should be very clear, that's a script they've picked up from American politics, mm. right? National level politicians who are always, I was raised in mm. humble beginnings and yet, yeah. uh, right? right? So I, I don't think that's new or particularly distinct about them. I think that's a kind of democratic habit that's been with us for a long time. Um, I will say I, I take seriously your point about viewpoint diversity on campus. I would encourage all of you to read John Shield's uh, recent book about conservative professors on campus. Um, he explores questions of viewpoint diversity and I think um, in some ways, uh, in the spirit of Angela's talk, suggests that there's a much richer kind of life there than we usually uh, take uh, for granted. Um, but in terms of uh, the idea that like students are like shutting down other people, unwilling to listen, one of the conventional stories in the press at least is that academic institutions are these like narrow isolating bubbles where people don't listen to, right, like, to anybody who doesn't conform to the ethos of the day. Um, and you know, of course, part of the story is that professors are um, you know, trying to convert our students to hippie, liberal, communist, you know, whatever, I, to which many of my colleagues say, I wish I could convert my students to hippie, liberal, communist, whatever, right? But they come to us having grown up in really isolated political and cultural bubbles um, in such a way that they are, in fact, very unprepared. They have no practice when they get to us at listening to people who come from different social classes, who come from different racial backgrounds. The fact that marketers can look at your zip code and predict with a really high degree of certainty what race you are, what political positions you are, what class you are, right? Um, what class you occupy, I think, is really telling. Um, and here I'm gonna tell a story. This is about a, a student of mine, you know, first generation student community college transfer who grew up in East LA. Um, and I'm always exhorting my, especially my most liberal students like her, you've got to take conservatives seriously. One way to do that is by, you know, talking to your friends who are conservative, right? <laughs> and she came into my office literally in tears and said, how do I find conservative friends? Where did you find yours? And I said, well, I grew up in a town where there were Democrats and Republicans. And, you know, sometimes I, like, wanted to kiss one of the people who didn't agree with me. So, right, like, I had early practice as a kid in being able to talk, even conversationally, to people who I knew had political positions that were anathema to me. Most of my students don't have that practice at all, right, which is one of the ways that I see the sort of viewpoint diversity, the speech part of it that we see on campus as the tip of a much bigger iceberg. Um, and I, in some ways, am more interested in, in talking about or hope that the conversations about speech on campuses draw our attention to the fact uh, that these are manifestations of much bigger um, social and political problems um, that I think do impair our civic life, do impede people's ability to conceive of themselves as part of a broader national whole um, as opposed to in these little spaces that for most of my students they've inhabited entirely all of their lives. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Obviously a very, very timely topic, but don't you really think that the students simply reflect the uh, attitudes of the, the faculty, the, the, their mentors, uh, uh, looking at vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Berkeley uh, compared to Hillsdale College? Um, well, I mean, you have to remember, first of all, that students self-select into colleges, right? It's not like students are like, well, I'm picking this college out of the hat, right? I'm going to Hillsdale now. My conservative professors convinced me to be conservative, right? Um, like, students think very carefully. You all, there are parents in this room. You know how it goes. You try to find a college that's the perfect fit for you. These are self-selecting institutions. Um, um, and, you know, besides the fact, you know, what is sort of what I just said to Mark, um, that the st students come to us politically pretty well formed, right, and self-selecting into whatever school they want to be to. Aside from that issue, um, one of the things that I've experienced in the last few years, which has really surprised me, 
is that some of the ideas that we associate with a kind of academic dissemination or propaganda aren't coming from faculty members, they're coming from students. Take the idea of cultural appropriation. Um, I taught a seminar in 2014, the same semester, I think it was 2014, whatever, it was the same semester that the Black Lives Matter protests were really erupting all over college campuses around the country. Um, uh, and so it was a hard semester to teach that class. And you know, in week two, one of my students comes in and says, you haven't talked at all about cultural appropriation. Um, and I said, well, you know, I've actually been looking around and you know, let, me, let me do some research so we can have a really informed discussion about like, what this is. And I look around online, can't find any academic literature really about cultural appropriation. The language of cultural appropriation comes from like subcultural black culture blogs like Blavity, right, that I hadn't even heard of, that my students read and have been reading since they were in high school. They're not academically generated, or to the extent that they're academically generated, um, they've really been picked up in this other world that professors, where professors are not the animating like propagators of a kind of ideology. So my own you know, interaction with the idea of cultural appropriation is kind of defensive, right? And trying to figure out, okay, you're bringing me this idea, how do we work with it? So my experience just doesn't track at all with the idea that professors are really the animators of this, of this politics. Um, I think that just doesn't reflect the reality that any of us experience, where our students really are getting lots of their political information, a lot of their central political terms and conceits. Um, before they come into college, outside the classroom, um, and um, you know, not even really from their parents, right? But from this kind of social, um, um, social media-ish world. So I haven't heard Susan uh, speak in I think a few years, uh, and I was a little worried today because. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I would be able to get up and say, Susan was actually my student uh, <laughs> at, at Princeton, and I'm very proud to say, uh, you were my student at Princeton. Uh, but then again, I was her father's student at Rutgers. So, <laughs> so it's a family affair. Uh, and part of the family affair, I think, is to uh, uh, provide, I, I, I think, uh, certainly what I learned from Susan's father, uh, uh, kind of, uh, the, the effort to see the, the iceberg submerged under the water uh, of, of the kind of the current controversies, that there's usually a deeper story, certainly in the American tradition. Uh, and the story that you tell is, uh, I think, appropriately, um, uh, uh, what, it, what it does is, is point to the way in which that, that submerged part of the iceberg presents us with very deep, profound, structural challenges uh, when, you, when you begin to see it in that light. So let me ask you the question that I constantly get asked on the road when I'm talking about my depressing book, uh, which is, uh, so what do we do? And, and let me ask you in the following, in the following tone or, or, or sense. Um, you, begin, you actually begin your talk by, by suggesting that Tocqueville suggests that Americans or democratic peoples will tend to exaggerate the differences between generations. Mm -hmm. And yet you quote him to say, wow, the differences between generations are actually going to be really, really big, uh, that, that the woof of time is broken. Mm -hmm. So actually Tocqueville himself suggests that uh, there will be, uh, certainly over time, a kind of a, a tendency in democratic peoples to be presentists. Mm -hmm. As he says, particularly in the chapter on individualism, a, a theme of, of the weekend, uh, that uh, democracy shatters the chain that sort of holds generations mm -hmm. together and liberates each link so that the, the past generation is obscured to the vision mm -hmm. of, of the current generation just as one's descendants uh, escape from one's view. So it seems to me Tocqueville is engaged in very much the thing that you suggest that uh, he might want to warn us against as a kind of concern that there's a kind of presentism, uh, a growing presentism that's likely in, an, in a kind of democratic individualistic age. Mm -hmm. uh, that quote that you began with by, by Christopher Lash, uh, I love that quote, the kind of, you know, the, the way in which you could say that one of the ways that you you generate the practice of care for the next generation is that experience of being a parent. Mm -hmm. Is that experience, I mean, you know, until we have kids, we don't have the slightest idea of what our, what our parents had to do, uh, all the sacrifices we had to make. And that experience then of wanting to raise children in a certain way and realizing the challenges that the contemporary culture presents. But what do we do then about an age in which by any measure, uh, the likelihood of that experience being firsthand or secondhand uh, the declining rates of family formation that you can say is not just one generation, it's been a sort of progression or a degression in our society. The likelihood of growing up, for example, in a household without siblings today uh, for, our, for our young people. 
Uh, the likelihood, even if you have siblings, that everyone has their own room and retreats to their own room and plays with their video games and never talks to their sibling except uh, maybe when they emerge occasionally for dinner, which they may or may not actually eat together as a family. I mean, every kind of measurement that if you look at sort of the social science measures, and we could talk about things that we talked about last night, family formation, the likelihood of participation in religious community, the likelihood of uh, being involved in associations and so forth. It's a story, it's a long story. It didn't just happen with this generation. Mm -hmm. This generation is in some ways the kind of, again, the next logical step in a society that's fragmenting and atomizing. So I, I agree with your diagnosis, I, and, I, and I thank you for it. But in a sense, you provide us with a diagnosis, and the cure, in a sense, uh, if, if Mark is right in his, his response to me last night, the cure can't be found in a way by trying to put something back together again, because as he put it, there are forces out there. And I agree, there are forces out there. But is that, in some sense, is simply to say, this is the way it is, and we've got the diagnosis, which I think you provided for us, mm -hmm. without a cure. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a terminal disease. America is a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're not going to leave this room thinking that's the case, and I hope not, what, what hope can you offer us from Southern California? <laughs> I'll tell you, you remind me of a, a couple of things. Those of you, I'm uh, sure, who are also on college campuses know that one of the things that's changed in the last 20 years in particular is that we get many more roommate conflicts and requests by students to like change rooms in their freshman year. And that has to do with the fact that more and more of our students are either only children or grew up with their own room and literally do not know how to inhabit a space with someone, right? Um, how to exist civilly in a small space space with another human being, um, which goes back to some of the other things uh, that I've been trying to get across in my answer to these questions. Um, I, I agree with you to the extent that these are, we, we see these, this kind of breakage apart, right, and declines of like, you know, families and siblingness, right? I know that you agree with me that this goes back to the very origins of social contract liberalism, and I know that you, like me, are fond of Bertrand de Juvenel's depiction of social contract liberalism as the philosophies of childless men who have forgotten their own childhoods, right? Um, that kind of, right, like that kind of orientation has been baked into modern liberalism from the beginning. And I do believe that to a certain extent, we can't escape that, we can't fix it, we can't correct it, and we can't undo it. Um, but I do think that you know, at the same time, even though that's big, I really believe in the fact that people are social creatures who want to re be around other people, who want to have rich relationships, like who my student, even though she doesn't know any conservatives, cries at the fact because she really, really is a good person who wants to be able to get along with other people, right? I believe that we should build and take those impulses, which I do believe to be there, <laughs> and try to figure out different ways to harness them and encourage them. Um, uh, some of it is by protecting the families that are still there. Some of it is each of us in our own small ways trying to work against that. I tell my students all the time, it's okay to go back to the town you're from. In fact, I'd encourage you to do that because when, when and if you have kids, you'll want somebody to take care of them so that you can occasionally ha take a shower, right? Um, and my students, all the time, sort of in this atmosphere of rootless cosmopolitan ambition, are visibly relieved to, to hear somebody in a position of authority say that to them, that it's okay, right? Um, it's okay to cultivate connections with your family, to not feel like you have to abandon them, especially, in fact, students who are from first, you know, who are first generation students um, and who grew up in like communities that are still pretty um, uh, sort of meaty and weighty. Um, I think also, and I don't want to be too Pollyannic here, um, uh, you know, as Kurt Vonnegut said, one of my favorite lines in any speech ever, right, uh, Pollyanna did not come to give, your, give the speech today. Um, but I do want to echo what Karen um, and Angela said yesterday, that I think there is more hope in millennial uh, politics in terms of what we see than we tend to allow. And for me, I think of the, one of the, the first episode of the first season of the television show Girls one of the sort of quintessential millennial shows. And in about the second scene, first episode, first season, two of the girls are walking down the streets in New York, and they're trying to figure out how one of them should respond to like a boy who's been problematic in their relationship. Right? And one of the girls says, well, obviously, the best way to communicate with him would be face to face, but that is not of our time. And obviously, the second best way would be to communicate with him by phone. 
but that is also not of our time. And so they agree they're stuck with text messaging. And what I love about that scene is the fact that yes, they're operating this sort of digital way, but they understand that it's at best a kind of third weight form of human communication. Um, uh, even though we tend to think of millennials as people who are uncritical acceptors of, of technology, I think that's absolutely not the case. Um, I think that you see, in fact, a lot of interesting tech, and I'm not, as you know, a big technological fan, but I think there are kinds of moves, especially in that generation of people to harness those technologies back toward the building of certain kinds of local communities in the most physical sense. I think we should encourage those. Um, me, I think of Wendell Berry all the time saying that, you know, the cure to the culture of bigness isn't like big answers, it's small answers. Um, it's individuals and groups and communities trying to do what they can to build up that kind of cultural reservoir. There's not a one size fits all answer. There's not one answer, there's many answers and we need many small answers to solve a big problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. That's a, this has been a fascinating talk, and this morning's talk was terrific as well. So I have two questions and then a comment. My first question is, can you say a little bit more about the demographics of millennials who voted for Bernie? And I ask that because um, I don't know whether they are getting that, you know, the economy is the root of all, uh, you know, of the solutions to the problem. If we address the economy, we can then address issues of sexism, racism, homophobia, things like that. Or if some, at some point they forget what they all, all know about those other systems of inequality. So I'm curious about that. I'm also, I'd love you to say more about what you see as the connection between the American search for identity and white supremacy, and, and to think about whether you can generalize from what you're saying globally, right? Are we seeing uh, this anxiety mm -hmm. being reproduced in countries where, you know, immigrants are coming in a lot, and so it's disrupting mm -hmm. the sense of identity there, and so the response mm -hmm. is a kind of national purity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the third comment has to do with viewpoint diversity. And my concern with some of the ways those conversations go is that they forget power and inequality, right? That my speech works a different way than, say, the speech of even, an, you know, an 18-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. That the speech of somebody like a Richard Spencer is going to work very differently than the speech of the first-generation college student. And so, uh, not only does speech, ha it, it, it is a performative, it has effects, it has an action, and you know, to what extent do we want to allow viewpoint diversity when the viewpoint is, I don't want you to or your kind to live in this world. Mm -hmm. I imagine a world in which mm -hmm. you don't exist. Mm -hmm. Jewish people, black people, whatever it is, right? I mean, that's what they were saying in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't, that's my comment. You know, the question I guess would be, where does this fit in your analysis? So, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, well, in terms of viewpoint diversity, I mean, I think uh, what you're saying is what I was trying to get at in terms of the way that I understand, right, some of what a lot of my students, their willingness to say something shouldn't be said on a call. It's not because they object to the idea, but I think they have, and this is very ill-formed, but this is an argument with a long and pedigreed intellectual lineage, right? An argument that we have to take seriously, even if we don't like it and don't want to adopt it, right? That even in a liberal society, there may be some things that in their utterance so undermine the foundations of democracy and liberalism that we shouldn't allow them. Right. Um, and we do have to debate where that line is, right? That, I mean, those are our conversations about, about hate speech, right? Um, uh, well, uh, and, I, and so I think, you know, the kind of viewpoint diversity question, I think my students are trying to work all of that out, right? I think that's something that's being tried to work out. And maybe this is a case where it would be great if all of our students could take courses in the history of political thought where they'd understand and be able to articulate what they're feeling, which I think precisely that in ways that are more intellectually legible to like society at large. Um, I do think absolutely that some of the nationalism uh, we see in the world today is produced you know, precisely by the kinds of things that Baldwin and Tocqueville had in mind. Um, uh, I would you know, refer the political theorists in the room um, to Wendy Brown's recent work about walling, right? Isn't it interesting, it, it, it shouldn't be surprising to us that in a world where borders are being broken down all the time, that that makes people nervous, right? And the response, a natural response is to wanna to put up walls somewhere, right? You physically wanna put up walls, or you intellectually wanna put up walls, or you culturally wanna put up walls. Um, uh, there's a kind of anxiety there that's more than just about the tangible anxiety about, say, losing one's job. 
right? Um, there's an anxiety about a lack of certainty in a kind of uncertain and, and, and huge world. So I absolutely think um, uh, that what we're seeing ac ac across the world is kind of this same kind of psychological thing playing out. Right? Something there is, as Robert Frost says, something there is that loves a, that does love a wall, right? The beginning of the... Um, uh, uh, I would say finally about the demographics of millennials, I don't have the demographics here, so I can't say much about the voting for Bernie. Um, but I do say, when, you know, at least anecdotally, talking to students I know um, who are passionate Bernie supporters, it was often about economics. This is a generation of student, which is gonna be college students, which are gonna be saddled with debt, like unlike debt that anybody in this room except for the college students probably has ever known. Um, and so, but also I think they, they did, one of the things they appreciated about Bernie, I heard this a lot, is that he wasn't, it was precisely because he wasn't making sort of pandering, what they took to be pandering identity, you know, politics kinds of claims, right? I remember when uh, Hillary Clinton had this social media campaign um, and the campaign was Hillary Quint Clinton is like my abuela, right? Um, it started by Hillary Clinton's people, right? And you were supposed to post on social media the ways that Hillary Clinton was like your Latina grandmother, right? And of course, like all the young Latinas were like, Hillary Clinton is nothing like my abuela because, right? Um, so I actually think in some ways, like they're pretty, you know, to the, even to the extent that identity politics is a part of their lives, they're pretty savvy about the cynical deployment of identity politics. Um, and I think in some ways, Bernie Sanders was a response to a kind of cynical deployment of identity identity politics to get young people's votes. And there's a lot more to be said there. But I think their politics are much more complicated and frankly much more democratic than um, most of us tend to assume. Hi, this is just asking for clarification. Mm -hmm. What or maybe which um, mass slaughter of children and adolescents to are you referring to? Oh, I mean you could think of plenty. Generation Kill, where I got the phrase, that's a book about the second Iraq war. Right? Our willingness to send uh, young men and women into constant wars, and we're in a constant state of war for the last 20 years. The fact that we allow the mass slaughter of children in schools to happen all the time. Um, I thought it was uh, pretty powerful um, to look at the March for Our Lives, organized though it might have been by all sorts of, you know, like corporate and special interest forces, to see young person after young person after young person very articulately and often without any coaching saying, we live in a world where you seem willing to have many of us murdered. You seem to think that that's okay. You heard that over and over and over and over and over again. We understand that we are expendable to you. Um, they were so articulate on that point, in fact, that lots of people said, these must be actors, right? Children couldn't, young people couldn't actually articulate that for themselves, right? But of course they could. And I think we should take those words very seriously. Um, uh, because I think they betray something that young people see. None of us grew up, right? Columbine happened in 1999, right? Right about the time when all these people are born, their whole lives, right? Children who go to school have been subject to the threat of mass murder, right? My kids who are four and seven years old do drills in which they lock themselves in closets. They come home crying. They're gonna remember that growing up. None of us had experienced that. And I think that's, I mean, that fact alone should be something that I think we should have in mind if we're trying to think about the mindset of young people who are voting. That's the world in which we have allowed them to grow up. Um, following up on that, I, it actually resonates with, with something I was thinking about last night with Mark's talk. Um, if you think maybe we're going to really possibly see something with the midterm elections, how, again, Mark, I, I can't help but wonder if some of the movements that are happening right now against gun violence that involve millennial actors, um, and not just millennial actors, but also um, movement, labor movements um, uh, in education uh, that aren't just happening um, at the secondary school level, but are happening at university campuses um, that are involving students um, are going to uh, bring voters out mm -hmm. and possibly, you know, elect new legislators at the state mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. um, and might be transformative in institutional politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 
I think that's a really important question. I think if you want to be infuriated, as we should all be infuriated by the national news media, and I mean this both as a criticism of Fox and a criticism of MSNBC and a criticism of the New York Times and a criticism of the Washington Post and a criticism of basically probably the everything that everybody in this room tends to read, they've given the, in this sort of preoccupation with the Russia shenanigans, they have overlooked what is what uh, organizationally, in terms of like power institutional politics, clearly the most interesting story leading up to the midterm elections, which are the teacher strikes in West Virginia and Oklahoma, right? Um, which really are, do seem to be reshaping political alliances in those states. Um, and so I do think that, that that's a story where education is, gonna, is a key piece, where labor is a key piece that I would keep my eyes on. I would keep my eyes on those developments for um, precisely the reasons that you suggest. I was told I should announce that I will be the last question. <laughs> oh. Is that okay? Did I do it right? Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, quick point and then a question. Uh, Susan, re regarding we're used to killing children and teenagers, you, you, you neglected to mention abortion. I just oh, yeah, of course. put right, that yeah, in sure. there. Um, I was struck by what you said, how when you grew up, you had friends of different viewpoints than you, right? And how that doesn't seem to be happening much these days. I have the same experience. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that when we live in a society, and this is both for children and, and for adults now, and I, I speak as a college professor in the humanities, got to watch what you say. Mm -hmm. um, we're afraid to identify our different viewpoints because we don't want to be professionally fired or, or what have you, or, or socially demonized, either as a child or as an adult. Um, I still have dear friends of different viewpoints, but most of them I got when I was a boy, and we still keep in touch. Uh, I don't know, Mark, if you know Ben Berger, he's the director of the Lang Center at Swarthmore. Are you familiar with that? No? Or, or, I know uh, Ben Berger, yeah. <laughs> you, you know the Lang? Okay, so Ben Berger's my oldest friend in the world we, since we were six. And then Peter Orner, uh, he wrote a, a article in the New York Times uh, right, about, right before uh, Marx came out uh, a month or so, uh, emails with my favorite Trump supporter. Does anyone remember that article by any chance? No? That's me. <laughs> I was his friend, so I just, I, you know, yeah, I supported the libertarian originally, but you know, Trump was the best I could do at that point, so I, because I didn't like Hillary, that kind of thing. But you know, the point is, we still stay in touch. He insults me all the time, but we love each other in spite of it. What I'm getting at is, do we have? It just seems like the the demonization, the social demonization that that can happen at such an early age at this point, as opposed to when I was a boy. We argued, we, we were always disagreeing, but we never seemed to think it was a personal issue, it seemed, where I grew up in, in uh, a Jew largely Jewish and, and Catholic suburb of Chicago. Um, we don't have that anymore, it seems. And so how can you foster that in communities when people are on the defensive, even at such an early age? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I want to say one thing. Uh, you're right. Like, abortion is something I should have mentioned. And in fact, I should uh, mention the way that my students are increasingly likely to talk about their support for abortion, which is not in terms of women's rights, but increasingly, I hear students say, well, this is a crappy world that's mean to children. Nobody takes care of them. Why would you want to bring a child into this world? People should be allowed to choose not, because nobody's going to be there to take care of them if you're not, right? Um, that, Right, that's a horror, right? That th these are the, the options, right, that they see, right? Um, and they're not wrong to see. Um, and I do think that's part of, um, you know, the broader world that um, my, my students um, and all of us inhabit. Um, I do think it's problematic, right, the, ex the extent to which we see the kind of personalization of political argument. I'm not sure I can offer many solutions beyond the kinds of solutions that people, you know, that I've already said and that other people in this room have already offered, which is that you have to model political disagreement that doesn't become personal. My students have never had that modeled for them, right? If they see uh, something on the internet taking a position, 
you go to the comments section, you don't get like, I really agree with your, uh, you know, one point, but I think that the rest of your analysis is flawed. You get, right, if you're me, you get, well, you're a hippie communist, and I know that because you're a professor and you're from California, right? So I'm not going to listen. I was never going to listen to anything you said, right? Or, you know, you're a, you're a Trump supporter, so therefore I know you're a white supremacist, you know, like woman hating, whatever, whatever, whatever. They don't have any, they, they really don't have a space in which any kind of disagreement um, that doesn't personalize immediately has been modeled for them. Um, I tend to think that by the time they get to colleges and university, it's too late to all of a sudden start modeling that for them, though we should probably try. I think that we probably have to redouble our efforts at the elementary and secondary um, levels in terms of education. Um, uh, but I think it's a really difficult problem. I think that kind of personalization of uh, debate has been, you know, to echo what you know, Patrick's saying, so long baked into the culture uh, that it's not like there's a sim simple policy fix that will get us out of that or any other problem. Thank you. Thanks very much.